so I'm going to step aside from the, from the podium because you can't see me otherwise. <laughs> um, I'll be talking today about voice sharing. Voice sharing is a way in which AI, I believe, can uplift us and actually make us, you know, just a little bit more human and connect us to one another. I am fascinated by the human voice. I'm a speech scientist, and as a speech scientist, I really studied the voice from a lot of different angles. One, from how speech is produced, from how it develops in the young child, what happens when someone loses their voice to a motor condition, and then how do we regain it, either behaviorally through therapies or through new technologies. And so my career has taken many different paths, uh, primarily from a speech therapist, um, who then went on to become a speech scientist, and, and then now much more even in the computer science area. And so what it is is an interdisciplinary field that brings together information from various different areas to figure out how we can not only celebrate speech and voice, but then use it in order to connect us more. And so, you know, when we think about the speech signal, it's more than just a signal. Last night, those of us who enjoyed the concert saw an incredible uh, orchestration of sound and music come together with different instruments. And I would argue that the human voice is an instrument in itself. And we learn to play it very early in life, right? Young children learn to babble and make sounds that are absolutely uh, adorable, but they also have meaning. And then those meaning, that sound is then shaped into speech that can give it even more power to convey ideas. And so it's natural, and if that is why it's been such a fascination for us to study for, for millennia. The other thing about voice is that it is connection. This clicker doesn't always work. Did I do something wrong? <laughs> there we go. So voice is connection. Voice allows us to connect to each other, and voice now is being used for us to connect to computers, which then allow us to connect to others. So voice AI is no more than just using voice as a method of interaction, but with a mediation of a machine in between. So the thing about voice, though, the reason it's so effective is that our voices are not identical. Every single person in this room has a unique voice, and that unique voice tells us something about your age, your gender, your cultural and linguistics background, how tall you are, uh, sexual orientation, um, whether you smoke or not, whether you have allergies, uh, whether you abused your voice yesterday, whether you're a musician. There are so many things that are encoded in our voices. And our voices are really our identities. And yet when you hear the voices in our technologies these days, you hear just a uniform set of voices coming from boxes and speakers that look like that. They all kind of look the same, too. They look like canonical little shapes that are spheres that emit sound, right? And that's just the beginning, I think. And our fascination with voice as a signal, um, I think, has led to this sort of this promise of where voice AI can go. I want to show you the, one of the earliest speaking machines that was developed. This is in 19, sorry, in 1845. Uh, this is a machine called the Euphonia, which was exhibited here in Philadelphia. Um, and it is basically a mechanical acoustic machine where there was bellows for representing the lungs, and there were tubes and tones for representing the rest of the vocal tract and the filter. Um, and even before that, von Kempler in, in 1791 had a machine that also tried to replicate speech. So we have been, for years, fascinated with how speech is produced and trying to figure out how we can reproduce it. That's the beginning. But today, we have lots of these devices. And today, it's 500 million speaking devices in our world. And we've really thought about speech mostly, and voice, mostly as a, as a signal, as a... As a functional signal, not one that's about connection. But when two mil 20 billion devices begin to talk by 2022, 
we cannot ignore the fact that those voices have to sound different. They have to sound individuated. The reason that we all have unique voices is this sort of an evolutionary reason, right? If we all had the exact same voice, it would be difficult to tell who's speaking. It would be difficult to get um, someone's attention. And that's going to be the same when we have 15, 20 things talking at us for whatever reason, they can't have the same voice. And moreover, we are already silencing a population that is unable to speak. So today's voice AI has sort of two principles. It's convenient and it's also information. It's, so it's all about information delivery. And information delivery is only one aspect in which voice is, is powerful. So where I want to be focused on is these individuals, millions of individuals, both in the US and around the world, who are unable to speak for whatever reason. Either they were born with a condition where they were unable to speak, or they acquire a neurological disorder later in life. Now, for them, one of the ways in which they can continue to interact with the world around them is by using an assistive technology. Today, those assistive technologies have the same voices as our Amazon Echoes and Google Homes have, um, and those are very limited. It means that they have already a condition where it isolates them, and we further isolate them by giving them a voice that's generic sounding. So this problem, I think, is starting to become resolved with various new technologies, and I think it's only going to be, the boundary is only going to be pushed when there will be other use cases where unique voices are important. Because this population, you know, just by virtue of who they are, are voiceless. They do not have a voice, and what we're trying to do is give them a unique voice. Okay, so let me tell you how we do that. I'm going to introduce you to two individuals. One is a young girl named Maeve, and the reason I'm showing you this is I want to tell you about why it is that a unique voice is important to individuals like this. So first, here's Maeve's story. So much harder to use words, and she should be able to use words that sound like her. Since it's her, with a little bit of me, it will be unique. She can actually say what she wants with her voice. Yesterday, Maeve, for the first time, spelled out the entire sentence, I love you, Daddy. <laughs> and I would love to hear that in a voice that I recognize as Maeve's. So it's not just for her, it's actually for the members of her family, right? And we'll get back to Maeve's story in a minute about how we made a voice for her. She uses actually a, a camera um, on the computer that can sense her eye movements. So it's a combination of so many different AIs coming together where the camera senses her eye movements, she selects the different words, those words are then synthesized by the device and the voice that comes out today is of a 40-year-old male, a woman, sorry, and what we wanna do is give her a voice that is much more fitting to her. And here's John. John is um, an individual who acquired ALS. He was a, an executive, um, and he tells us a story about what his voice meant to him. Losing the ability to speak, to express yourself, is probably the worst thing about ALS. He is able to speak using an assisted communication device connected to his iPad. I want people to hear me. But the voice isn't his. I miss not being able to show emotion by tone or inflection. I miss being able to call my dog by raising my voice. I miss being able to whisper sweet nothings into Linda's ear. John tells a story of the fact that he went to a, um, an ALS fundraiser. Right, and uh, that voice that he uses there is the voice, uh, it's called uh, Ryan. And he, he jokes around saying, you know, there's so many Ryans in the room that when he goes to the bathroom or he comes back that he can't find his wife or his wife can't find him because she's looking for a Ryan and <laughs> there's so many Ryans in the room. And so even thinking about sort of how it separates two individuals, um, that voice is that connector, right? Okay, so what can we do about this? It's not, you know, there is obviously a problem. What do we do about this? Here's where I think voice AI for good um, can really change things for these individuals. 
Okay, the reason there aren't synthetic voices that are unique to individuals is just as Julia mentioned, it is so expensive to create a synthetic voice. In fact, the Siri voice, so Susan Bennett is the voice behind Siri. So she was a voice actor who recorded hours and hours of speech for several weeks in order to create just that corpus of speech used then to create the synthetic voice. That's hundreds of millions of dollars or some undisclosed amount that, that, uh, that Apple paid for this in order to create one 40-something Midwest-speaking you know, white American voice, right? And now she speaks to all of us. Yet the audience that's consuming that is varied. And in our world today, if the things that speak to us speak to us in one common voice, how do we connect to them when we come from so many different diverse backgrounds? So the problem, though, is the, the process of making the voice has been, in the past, very time consuming. You know, it, we've taken snippets of speech, stitched stitch them together, and wherever those join points of speech are, sort of tried to smooth them. Today, with the advance of machine learning technologies and deep learning tools, there are new ways to build voices that allow them to be scalable. And that's what we're actually using in, in order to build voices for those who can't speak now at my company, Vocal ID, as well as many other um, new, new kinds of vo synthesis is tackling voice synthesis in a completely different way than we did before. The other thing, too, is that for people who are unable to speak, though, no matter how you can make a voice, well, what do you do with someone who's unable to speak? They don't have, you know, even if it only takes a few hundred sentences now to make a voice and it can cost a few thousand dollars, if they can't make sound, what do you do, right? And so this is where the scientific breakthrough was for us. Back in 2002, I was at a conference and talking about individuals who can't speak can still control some aspects of their voice. They can still control the pitch of their voice, the loudness of their voice, some aspects of the tempo of their voice. And this sound that they make, even though we can't hear words in those sounds, there is identity in those vocalizations. And so we took a scientific theory of speech production, which is that speech is a combination of the source, which is the vibrations of the vocal folds. And then the rest of that sound is pushed through the vocal tract. Which, co which creates consonants and vowels. So we took that theory of source and filter of speech production and said, if we're going to synthesize speech, why can't we just decompose it into source and filter? And for some people, they can only produce the source. These are the non-speaking individuals. But we'll borrow the filter from others who are similar to them in age and size and gender and all of that, and then recombine it so we only have the source from the non-speaking individual and only the filter from the healthy surrogate talker. So that's the science. So here, this is how it goes. The source and the filter in you and I are produced in one organism, right? But when we resynthesize this for synthesized speech, it no longer has to be that way. We can separate the two. We can have non-speaking individuals make sound, and we can separate their source from their filter. We can have another group of speaking individuals produce sounds and sentences, separate their source and filter, and then we recombined the egg yolk and the white from different ones, right? That's all it is. And so that science behind what we were doing, I had an opportunity to talk about this at the, at the TED stage, which was really exciting back in 2013. And when I first gave this, started giving this talk, uh, or preparing for the talk, uh, it was really just the scientific theory of how do we do this recombination. And about two weeks before I gave the talk, the, um, I had to give a, uh, a uh, a preview of the talk to the group, um, to a small select group. And they said, you know, this is great. The science is really interesting. But what do you want people to do when they leave that room? And I said, I have no idea. And they used this word, call to action. And I said, I don't know. I'm a scientist. I don't know what a call to action is. I, I don't know. I just want them, well, what if they could donate their voice, I said flippantly. And they said, yeah, go with that. Just go with that. And I thought, <laughs> well, how? Like, are they going to come to my lab? What are they going to do? Um, so I put up this website, and uh, we thought a couple of hundred people would come. My studies are typically on people who can't speak, so there's like 10 to 15 people in these studies typically. And I thought 200 people, if they sign up, whew, this would be my biggest end study of my life, right? Thousands of people signed up within just a few weeks. And then within a few months, when the, and the, when the, the talk was actually released, um, not just live, 
there were tens of thousands of people signing up to be volunteers. Now, just because someone says that they're going to volunteer to submit their voice doesn't necessarily mean they're going to do it. But it meant there was an opportunity, and that's actually what spawned the company Vocal ID. What we started was with a voice banking studio, um, a virtual studio, if you may, where you, it's just a website. You have anyone from their home can record their voice in this virtual studio, and they're just told what to read, so there's no issues of privacy. You don't ask them to say anything else. We just ask them to read aloud these sentences, which is actually how synthetic voices were built in the first place. And as they read, what happens is they see the sounds that they are producing, oops, I keep doing this, um, on the back wall here. Um, and that's what we call this is the periodic table of speech sounds. It's basically just uh, the different sounds that are produced. I don't know how to use this uh, highlighter, so I won't right now. The sounds that the fr produced at the front of the mouth are in this first column here. Sounds produced at the back uh, of the mouth are in the far column, and vowels are in between. So as you produce these different sentences, you hear a visualize or you see a visualization of the sounds that you have banked over time. It is kind of a boring task, I would just say, as you go along. The first few hundred sentences that you read, you're thinking, this is exciting. But then after a while, the visualization gets a little dry. But, but that's, it's a mundane task in order to get the recordings, right? And then from those recordings, then, we can create a voice. So I'm going to just show you a quick video of people around the world who have contributed their voice. And what you hear is really the texture of the voice that we're collecting. Hi. 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 How are you today? 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 So you hear both young voices and old voices. You hear voices that are you know, recorded in good context, voices that are not recorded in very good context, and so on. We can collect these voices. We can, we've built lots of algorithms to clean out the audio and then use them to build a voice. So what do we do? We can get a voice sample from someone like Maeve. She might just be able to produce a sound like this. <laughs> and then from that little bit of speech, what we do is, or vocalization, we find a match in our voice bank similar acoustically, demographically, and then we combine that individual sound, so we do that decomposition like I showed you. Ice cream is my guilty pleasure. And we're morphing those sounds together, right? So we're separating and, and recombining, and then we feed that to a deep neural network. And then from there, we can create a voice like this. I can't wait for my friends to hear my new voice. My parents are really happy I'm not addicted to Fortnite. <laughs> now she sounds like a little girl. Still robotic in some sense, right? Still a synthesized voice, not necessarily a replica of her, but we're getting there. And what this sounds like today versus what it sounded like a few years ago, completely different. But it's not just people. How are you? Good morning. Say, uh, one, two, three. That was awesome. Such a cool experience, not just see it, but be part of it. I'm really excited because I think I'll really get to hear from a voice that sounds like Maeve. I think she's really excited for it, and I think she's going to love it. What do you think about her new voice? And what she's going to do with it. I feel excited. I want to say hi to Taylor Swift with my new voice. <laughs> Quite frankly to me, I think I will have heard from my daughter for the first time. That's Maeve. I'm going to actually speed up a little bit because I, I'm seeing that I'm a, uh, a little short on time. So I'm going to skip to, oh, I can't skip to. This is clunky. Ah. Okay, I'm going to skip to this because I want to show you. The only thing I liked in school is arithmetic. I want to show you other individuals for whom we can also build a voice. So 
Um, those are the first two, John and Maeve, I spoke to you about, are individuals who didn't have an opportunity to, uh, they didn't, either couldn't speak, or, and, and for John, he just didn't bank his voice before he could. But if we could preserve someone's voice before it was lost, okay, then we could create a voice for someone who is about to lose their voice from head and neck cancer, ALS, a number of different conditions. What you're hearing here is voice samples recorded by an individual named Lonnie, who we're gonna see in a little video in a bit, um, who has head and neck cancer, non-smoker. Many people believe that sort of head and neck cancer is only a disease for, for smoking individuals. It's not, right? It's prevalent for many reasons these days. And so we bank his voice initially. We can then recreate his voice for him as well, okay? Same way, um, you take those recordings, put them through the deep neural network system, and then we create Sometimes the heart sees what's invisible to the eye. Sorry, it keeps going through <laughs> animations. But you get a sense now that you can get, actually then use this voice on a speaking device, and he uses it on an iPhone or an iPad. So I'm just gonna show you now a little video of him using his synthetic voice. We're looking forward to hopefully being more vocal. So, this is the device, all right? So we can open up the Vocal ID app here. Both of them are fitted with your voice. Is there anything that you'd like to say? Good afternoon. Here we go. Nice. How does it sound? Good. Pretty good? Really great quality sounds just like me. That's great. Yeah. It's strange to hear it, but it's good. I like the speaker on his neck so that, you know, I think we just better keep that away from the kids. <laughs> He'll be saying things he don't want to be saying. <laughs> I don't really like talking for him. So he can now talk for himself again. Back to talking to Papa. And he can talk back. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So over the years, uh, the last two and a half years, what we've been doing is actually getting people to contribute to the voice bank. And that community engagement has taken many shapes. One is we've had the opportunity to work with big um, marketing companies that have helped us create pro bono sort of videos that help us get people to understand what voice banking is and why they should contribute their voice. We've also engaged youth in this. So there are many kids um, as part of this program that I've created called STEM for Social Change, where children help understand the diversity and the importance of voice, and they actually run voice drives. So I think all of these have helped change people's lives, and there's many individuals on, in the voice bank today. And that isn't really, I think it's an important piece of how we get to the next level. And I think the, one of the biggest things is, though, is how can this technology be propelled further if there were other applications, right? Other sort of mainstream applications of the technology that are going to continue to drive getting voices to those who need them most. And so in this voice first future that we're talking about, the importance of personalized voices is gonna be important to introduce trust as well as introduce complexity and sort of a um, customization of voice. So we've been creating now designer voices, we call them, for brands, where we can take multiple different kinds of speakers and combine their voices to create brand voices. This helps us create a broader application that can help us pay for those uh, for the social good applications that we want to do. So here, I'll just give you a quick sample of three voices that could be combined to create a, com a custom voice. Every morning at 8 o'clock, she teed off at the first hole. There's nothing like sleeping in your own bed, which is a gigantic roller coaster high above the ground. And again, we build this. Oops. Uh, I guess we'd, he's coming up in this one, so I'll just show you. So here's the unique sort of universe of voices that we're building today. This is my vocal identity. My voice may be soft, but my aspirations are bold. My voice gives away my deepest secrets. Sometimes the heart sees what's invisible to the eye. You can blame gravity for falling in love. 
I give voice to my favorite causes. My friends like my new voice. It takes courage to speak up and to listen. My voice can command a room and soothe a baby. And that was the voice that was, I was trying to last play you. Sometimes this clicker is not working with my animations. But you get a sense of the diversity of voice that we are trying to create now. With this, though, one of the things I want to caution against is what happens when we create all these unique voices and they become more and more human-like. Today, we still can hear synthesis in the voices that we are creating, right? But this summer, there was a demo by Google called, Dupl called Google Duplex in where they were able to convince people that that was a human being, right? And that is not that far away. And so when we create these technologies that are human-like, any AI, whether it's a voice AI or whether it'll be vision or whatever it may be, we have to think about the unintended consequences because as we start to trust these machines, there's something else that we have to think about ahead of time and not after, like we're seeing is happening in social media. Because voice is identity, right? And more and more companies these days are using voice as a method of authentication, as a way in, for us to interact with our health records, our banks, and so on and so forth. And so one of the big things that we're doing as we think about creating voice AI that starts to emulate each of us, we are also thinking about the unintended consequences. And I think that is uh, a question that maybe we can open up during um, some of our panel discussions of when we create voice AI or any other AI, what are the implications that we didn't plan for? And how can we, ahead of time, think about building in methodologies to protect against that? So thank you for your time today, and I will end with that. Uh, Michael Silverstein from Chicago. Um, I, I find this very fascinating um, in, in along two different dimensions. One is, um, are these um, uh, recordings then simply cut and pasted? Um, uh, because, uh, I mean, knowing something about the nature of the signal, um, the, um, things like intonation uh, and stress and so forth, is, and certainly in a language like English, are a function of the syntactic structure, yes. as has long been known. So, uh, and of course we know that syntax is generative, that is to say you can say an infinite number of new sentences. So what is the relationship between data banking specific yep. utterances and, your, and the generativity, if any, of, of, the, of the system? The, the second thing is that um, most of the models for um, generating speech really rely upon the segmentation of the phonological mm -hmm. signal and so on and so forth. No one has really um, been able to figure out the indexical qualities of language, that is to say, the ones that involve identity, right. and reduce it to a system of a particular sort. So um, uh, there must be something in the way of a kind of mimicking uh, in, your, I in your system. So both of those dimensions are very interesting. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, so to the first question in terms of are you cutting and pasting? So there are many methods of speech synthesis. And one of the predominant methods, concatenative speech synthesis, which was taking speech, cutting it into units, and then gluing it together, which is how Siri was made, right? Um, that technology is not what we're using today. And in fact, that's too labor intensive and too time consuming. Um, and it's not just, it's also because you have to have enough speech in order to then regenerate that. These days, with using deep neural network-based technologies or sort of um, parametric-based synthesis, you're collecting speech, you're learning the patterns from that speech, and then you're regenerating or resynthesizing speech. Uh, so it's, it's different. And that's what allows us this to scale. So we can, when we left the, you know, got out of the laboratory, it was tens of thousands of dollars to make each voice. Now we're able to make voices for hundreds of dollars, right? So, they're not Siri-like in quality, um, but they are more unique. And so there is this trade-off between the two. Now, the second question is sort of how do you get at the identity aspect? And that is the million-dollar or billion-dollar question, is how do you get at the essence of identity? And what is identity? I mean, in the cases of individuals who are non-speaking like, like Maeve and, and John, they only have control of sort of this 
the bottom half, right, of their speech musculature. And there, you know, we're trying to harness something from the source of their sound, like the pitch and the loudness of their voice and breathiness of their voice. And that's, there's a lot of identity there. But a lot of identity also is in how we shape consonants and vowels for our accents and so on. Um, so it really depends on where we can get the signal. Um, and identity is in all of it. It's not separable from one to the other. Um, but if we only have control over one half, you'll take what you can from there. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah, balcony. Uh, yes, Larry Einhorn, Indiana. Uh, voice identity is unique, but it changes with age. Yes. What about Maeve as she gets older? Thank you so much for that question. Um, what we are doing is algorithmically trying to change the voice over time. So the way we do that is that we think of voice aging as sort of in four different age bands, if you may. So a child voice, an adolescent voice, uh, an adult voice, and then a mature voice. And, do, and through those periods, within those age bands, we can algorithmically change the voice slowly. Of course, when you skip across those, just as you know, going from a child to, through puberty, there's a big step function change. And there, you really have to rebuild the voice, because otherwise, it'll have voice breaks. And those voice breaks are not going to sound too great. Although it's funny, because when we create voices sometimes for, for young people, um, their family members often want things that, as you know, as a as a speech scientist or a speech pathologist, you're like, no, you can't have that. Like, you can't have an accent. You can't have not an accent, sorry, a, a lisp, right? But they want that because it's natural. Like, developmental lisps are natural, right? They've never had their non-speaking child. They've never heard their non-speaking child say "wabbit" for "rabbit," um, and it's you know, it's something sort of. It's interesting that you sort of yearn for that. Um, but e even voice breaks, perhaps, are interesting. But so what we're thinking about is how do you do this without breaking the signal completely, is how do you slowly change the voice over time? Uh, Margaret Levy, Stanford. Thank you for a very interesting talk. And you mentioned duplex and other such technologies. Yes. You might elaborate a little to those who don't know about them, what they do. But how are we going to develop confidence and trust that the voices we're hearing, yeah. particularly if we can't see the person or actually the voices or see them on a screen, yeah. are actually the voices and the people that we think they are? It's a great question. Yeah, so, so Google Duplex is, was a kind of like a, a way to introduce the fact that voice AI is getting more and more sophisticated. Now, the thing is, the way that those samples were created um, takes a lot of time because it's a new type of technology, a new type of synthesis. It typically takes hours to create just a few seconds of sound, so it's not easily deployable today. But easily deployable today, and what will happen in three months from now or six months from now is just a matter of time. It's not a matter of, can this, is this possible? Right? In our own voices in the progression of the technology from like 2015 to today are categorically different. We measure sort of things like understandability. What we were getting out of the lab was around 70% understandable for these fast made voices. And today it's somewhere like 90% understandable, right? So it's really quick changes. So some of the things in terms of how are we going to know, that's one thing we recently, um, just within those last six months, have started becoming, getting approached by financial institutions that are afraid of the fact that they're, they're instituting uh, voice authentication in all of their, their uh, systems, right? So you're calling in and you're, you're authenticating not only by your PIN and your password, but by your voice. Um, and so what they asked us to do was build synthetic voices the way we build them, because we're creating these fast ways to make voices. Um, and would that spoof their system? And so we, we're doing the, that work right now, and we're also trying to do things like embed signals within the speech uh, synthesis that we create. Now, that's only the voices that, you know, a hacker's not going to necessarily want to have those signatures in there. And so what's happening is this evolution of or using open source tools. So many people have access to it. It used to be that speech synthesis was done at Bell Labs or in certain places where there was so much domain expertise. Now, even without that domain expertise, there is the capability of using these tools. So can we embed things into the synthesis? Can we build sensors that can detect the difference? I mean, it's going to be very important for our politics. It's going to be important for finance is one thing. Yeah, you can steal people's money. But the other, the bigger thing is is healthcare, health records, right? So 
imposing, posing as someone else, right, has massive challenges to our society. So when we are trying to do social good, we've got to think about the, the unintended consequences before. Building in things inside the technology today as we make it faster and better and emulate those human traits, rather than cleaning up our mess, which we know we're going to make, you know, not in 10 years or in 20 years, but in a few years. Thank you very much. I think now it's time for the break.